Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. Today, we're digging into how you can reboot your company culture, and it's going to be with Robert Passan. He is a Chicago civic leader. He's a board member at WBEZ, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, the Media Project in Chicago, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Trust. But his day job is the chief wagon officer at Radio Flyer. That is a company that his grandfather, Antonio, my middle name, by the way, <laughs> um, founded over 100 years ago. So listen up. There's some good old stories here that are going to come out today. And as most of you know, Radio Flyer is that iconic red wagon brand that most of us played with when we were little boys and girls. Uh, some of you still do play with them, at, I'm sure, especially if you have kids. And Robert leads a, a team of what he calls phenomenal flyers. That's F-U-N. I love that little play on words. And they create all types of awesome products to inspire imaginative play with kiddos these days. And of course, they've been recognized over the years uh, dozens of times, including number one on Fortune's Best Workplaces, uh, Wall Street Journal's Top Workplaces, The Best Places to Work in Illinois, and Crane's Best Places to Work in Chicago, of course. But my favorite is uh, most patents per capita. There's something that we usually don't measure too much. Welcome, Robert. It's good to see you again. Great to be here, Dean. Thank you. Looks like you're uh, looks like you're in Mexico or something down there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're we're here we're here quarantining in Mexico for a while. Excellent, good place to be. Hey, instead of CEO, does everyone call you the CWO? Really, the chief wagon yes. guy? I yeah, chief that wagon part. officer. That's my title. Uh, how did that get started? Well, early on at the company, uh, when I was the early on when I was the CEO, I was saying that title, and I just thought it sounded way too serious and corporate for what we're all about, since we're all about fun and playfulness. So it just evolved to CWO. Definitely not, definitely not fun. The the last episode, uh, that's really why you're on because you're a fun company. I'm kidding, but the, the last episode, <laughs> we, I, the, 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 we talked a lot about how I kind of you know view opportunities in life, and it's like it's got to be for fun, for money, and for impact. But if the fun box isn't checked, I definitely don't do it anymore. So, you know, it'd be I good. Like I, I, I know a lot. Oh, thanks. I know a lot of people think they know about your company, but you know, a hundred years is a long time. Can you just give them a little overview of the the company itself before we kind of dig into what you've done with it? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, it really all started with my grandpa, Antonio, as you said. And, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I just loved his story because he invented the radio flyer. Yeah. And his life is really the quintessential American immigrant success story. Um, and he was born into a working class family in northern Italy. And uh, his family, his dad and grandpa were carpenters, um, but they were very poor. And so at the age of 16, Antonio decided to come to America in search of a better life, like so many other immigrants. And he landed in Chicago and he worked to find any job he could. You know, he was digging ditches, carrying railroad ties, washing vegetables um, until he was able to save up enough money to rent a small garage on the west side of Chicago. And once he got into that garage, he started putting his carpentry skills to work, uh, first furniture and then building phonograph cabinets, those old Victrolas that you'd crank up to play records. Oh, yeah. Uh, and eventually a wooden wagon that he used to haul, haul tools around in his workshop. And um, pretty soon he was selling more wagons than anything else. So I, I guess today we'd call that a pivot. So he pivoted <laughs> to focusing exclusively on wagons. And he called the first one the Liberty Coaster Wagon because the first thing he saw when he came to America was the Statue of Liberty. And he was very inspired by that. Beautiful. Um, yeah. And so then he started to build that business up and hire workers and increase production. And, um, and then one day when he was visiting an equipment supplier, he was introduced to the metal stamping technology pioneered by the auto industry. And he had the brainstorm of seeing that he could apply this new technology to his product in order to mass produce it. And this is what w resulted in the creation of the iconic little red wagon that we all, all know and love. And, he named it Radio Flyer, and everyone always says, why Radio Flyer? And it's because it was the two coolest high-tech inventions of the day, the radio and the airplane. So I think if you were naming it now, it would be something like Quantum AI Dronester. <laughs> or, or not changing the name. Wouldn't that be lovely? 
Uh, I love that inspirational name that he came up with. Yeah. Yeah. So, so a hundred years is a long time. I mean, um, your company has survived really tough times. I mean, they actually grew through the Great Depression in the 1930s. Most companies went out of business, um, including a lot of them in, in Chicago, like sewing machine companies and everything back in the day that was, uh, you know, becoming industrialized. Um, but, you, it, but, you know, any company I think that's been around for over 100 years, you can kind of get to what we call a Kellogg. You can hit the BFS stage, big, fat, and slow. And when I, when I, talk, to most, uh, when I talk to most BFS public companies and private, you're one of the, you know, oldest private companies, so definitely in, uh, in Chicago. Um, they say, well, that, you know, that's, that's kind of like the nature of our company. I'm like, yeah, but it's the connected tissue of that Venn diagram you should be worried about. It's irrelevance, it's obscurity, it's decline, and more important, in the center of it, something called death. So a lot of companies, they're not around to be on podcasts right now. So, But at one point, I think even your company was kind of uh, infected um, with entitlement, mediocrity, disengagement, and you changed all that. What? Um, and, and I've always been curious about that because when I look, when I come in and help people reboot companies or if I'm rebooting it myself as a CEO, I focus on three things because about all I can focus on these days, which is people, platform, and passion. And there's tons of work to do in each one of those stacks. But I'm really curious about how did you approach it? How did you turn it around? Because a lot of that is, you know, that's serious stuff. And then most importantly, how did you shift the culture to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, you know, fortunately, um, I was born into the family that started Radio Flyer, and we had this brand, this wonderful brand that everyone had grown up with. So when I started at the company, I was 23 years old. Um, it was 1992, and I like to say I was green, clueless, and um, and I walked into the office uh, that day, and um, it but it wasn't my first time to the company. I had worked there summers growing up. Um, sure, and I'd, sure. I'd really fallen in love with the company at an early age. But when I started on that day, day in 1992, walking into the building was kind of like walking into a time capsule. Like nothing had changed since the Eisenhower administration. You know, it was like in the offices, it was the same decorations, the same uh, draperies. Um, and uh, And my dad was running the company at the time. And, you know, any company, like you said, has been around as long as we have, will have the ups and downs. And I soon, soon learned we were in a down. Um, and on that day, my dad said, hey, I want you to meet this guy. His name is Jerry. He's here from the bank and he's here helping us. Oh, no. um, and I, <laughs> I later, yes, you knew what I didn't know at that time was that Jerry was a workout guy. And he sat me down and just started yelling at me saying, you have no cash. Do you guys get it? You have no cash. And he just got redder and redder in the face. And he was you know, trying to shock the system and make everybody wake up that we were in trouble. Um, and the company had been losing money. Um, we, the bank was threatening to call our loan. And, um, and it was because we'd had a number of really, really tough years and the company wasn't, wasn't um, thriving and it wasn't growing. Right. And uh, right about that time, same, my first year at the company, um, competitors came out with plastic wagons. And it was a classic case of, you know, disruption to the market. We didn't see it was coming. We weren't talking to consumers. We were this inwardly focused manufacturer. And uh, immediately those plastic wagons started taking away sales from our cash cow, the town and country wooden wagon. Um, and so we were thrown into complete crisis. And, you know, I think that was one of the reasons why we were able to change be was because we were able to hang in there long enough to use this crisis to our advantage and start changing the culture and start building. But it was a huge learning curve for me. I had to learn everything and, um, and we just started to get to work on it. Yeah. That, um, those were tough times too. What year was that? 90. Yeah, nineteen. I mean that, that's, I started in 1992, but the period of time yeah. I'm describing was really, my first 10 years at the company was really this process of turning it around. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, um, I, my, my dad was a, uh, a big shot at like Montgomery wards. And I always remember going into those offices and just the, the just, you could just feel the bureaucracy oozing into your <laughs> suit coat at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you mentioned curtains, when I, uh, I, uh, went to uh, LG Zenith to uh, be their president of their, um, cable TV division. Uh, and the first thing I did is I came in at this huge corner office there on uh, 
the expressway and, and I noticed all these cur- first of all the windows were already narrow and they had curtains on them and mine were orange which is my least favorite color and I just left FedEx and you know purple and orange wasn't a bad combo but it's like that was their colors at the time and they got they had a guy that came in and said um you know, I'm in charge of the curtains. What, what color would you like? I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we are in trouble. And he would just, you know, wash them and recycle them and move them around at the offices. So that when that night I tore all the curtains down and ripped the hinge, it just, just tore everything down. And at least we could see out the window a little bit. The turnarounds are tough, though. How did you know where to start? I mean, you probably didn't start with culture because you were in triage. Yeah, exactly. We didn't. I mean, it it was clear why we had existed to make steel and wood wagons, but it wasn't clear why why we should continue to exist. It felt like we were becoming a buggy whip company doomed to extinction. Um, so we just, I mean, I started asking questions. I always took the approach of I'm a student, I'm here to learn. And we started asking questions like, you know, what does Radio Flyer mean to people? Um, what emotions does it evoke? What adjectives do people use to describe Radio Flyer? Really, why do we exist? Why does the world need us? And fortunately for us, because we had this legacy brand, some really strong themes emerged. Um, okay. And usually the first thing that people do when you say Radio Flyer, the first thing they do is smile. And the second thing <laughs> they do is tell a story. And there are always these heartwarming stories about childhood and imagination and adventure and being with people they love. So we started to be able to articulate that, oh, you know, the thing we've got here is this brand and this relationship that people have to the brand, you know, and and some of the key aspects of the brand are that it's a vehicle of the imagination and it can take you anywhere you want to go. It can be a race car, a rocket or a spaceship. So we really started to key into those brand attributes and, and we started to develop products that made sense with that. So Uh, For example, we started to do a lot more market research. I told you we weren't really talking to consumers, so we started doing that a lot and asking questions. And one question we would always ask is, tell me about the radio flyer you had as a kid. And of course, consumers would tell us about their wagon, but they'd also often say, well, I had a radio flyer tricycle. We'd say, hmm, wow, really? What, What did it look like? And I'd say, well, it was red, it was shiny, it had chrome handlebars, it had a big bell, it was a radio flyer. Tassels, exactly. Um, and we're like, wow, this is amazing because we never made tricycles, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, but people remembered this tricycle. They had that tricycle. They were I describing that Schwinn it. Just, that did that another sh- yeah, right down the street yeah, from you. Right, right. And the other brands that they didn't remember anymore, but since we were around, they put our brand on it. So we thought, wow, Hey, let's do something really smart. Let's make a tricycle. So, um, so we felt like if we could deliver those design cues they remembered and layer our brand on top of it, then they would point to it and say, that's the Radio Flyer tricycle I had as a kid. And that's exactly what happened. And so we came out with that classic trike, and it's still a great seller almost 20 years later, that very same model. But then we also started to do more things that kids could ride, anything that kids could ride, tricycles, scooters, um, things like that. And that's really how we started to fuel our growth. Right. Makes a lot of sense. The um, that that was an interesting time too, because so you had to pivot on both people, platform, the products and services, and ventures, and the passion. Passion probably came last. But um, how many people do you have, by the way? How big is the company now? Yeah, we have eighty people in Chicago. And you do a lot. You do a lot of offshore manufacturing, so you probably aren't counting all those. But you, you have a lot. Of, you employ a lot of people to keep this engine running, mm-hmm. uh, one one way or the other. The um, you know, you recently had, recently, a few years ago, a 100-year anniversary. Not too many companies are allowed to actually celebrate that. They just don't make it. And you produced this amazing video, Taking Flight. I must admit, I, I cried a little bit when I watched it. It was it was. <laughs> that really, was the goal. I, I mean, it started out, I'm like, oh, great, a cartoon. And I was like, whoa. I, my eyes just kept, like, bulging up and... Um, yeah, what was the impact on that for your customers and your employees or your partners? What, which which group resonated with that most? Yeah, it, it, we had an amazing response to that. We've had millions of people watch it, and it's really this heartwarming story that's uh, beautifully animated about this kid, uh, this dad who's dropping off his son at his at the grandpa's house because the dad's super busy and he's his cell phone's ringing and he's very distracted and. The kid yeah, thinks you're he's not sure have... if he's a single parent and everything. It's very modern. Yes. Yeah. Clever. Yeah. And and um, and so the kid thinks he's going to have this boring day at grandpa's house when he discovers the radio flyer wagon. And then the adventure begins. The grandpa takes the, the young boy on this adventure through their imagination. 
And we wanted to capture, you know, the intergenerational aspect of Radio Flyer, the fact that our products are often handed down from generation to generation, the fact that it's a touchstone of, of childhood for so many people. Um, and we also wanted to experiment with, you know, this kind of animated storytelling, and we want to do more of that. So we would love to do a kids TV series or something like that. So we have some of those things in the works right now. Um, and one of the really cool things was that we ended up winning an Emmy for the, the short. So it was really a wow, fun, wow, creative amazing. project. Not too many companies have won an Emmy just talking about their product. I love, <laughs> I love the uh, product extension, though. Kind of like Lego has moved into so many other things. You know, not successful, but that, that is a great idea. We talk a lot about that. How do you shift your business model, get into different margin kind of platforms? And um, uh, the other thing you do on product development is, um, you know, we talk a lot about on the program about... Um, you know, whether you should build your own uh, new products and services, whether you should buy them through acquisition or whether you should do what we call borrowing. So partnering, co-creation, the gig economy, you know, you do offshoring accounts uh, using third party companies. But um, tell me about some of the partnerships you've uh, you've done recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the most notable one is the partnership we have with Tesla. Um, oh and, gosh, uh, that is so. That car is so cool. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. been it's it's been a great product and a lot of fun. And every time I walk by it, it's in, it's in the Tesla showroom in Chicago. My yes. uh, girlfriend used to say, "Really, you should get that for the kids." I'm like, I think they're a little big for that, aren't they? <laughs> Maybe we should just get them the big four wheel drive wagon. And uh, it's beautiful. It's the most stylish yeah. thing I've ever seen. What, yeah, so what, was three... that, what was that process like working with Tesla? Yeah, it's for three to seven year olds. Um, yeah, what, well, what so I can't get it for myself then. Don't okay. <laughs> no, you'll have to get the full size one. Yeah. Um, yeah, whenever we look at trying to get into a new product category, our, our product development team, which is our largest team, so we have a team of designers and engineers who, who work on coming out with many new products every year. And we were looking at a way to get into these, you know, electric car for kids, uh, these battery operated cars. And as we study them, so we go into people's homes, we interview consumers, we watch how kids are playing with things, and we're always looking for how can we make it better and different? And are there any problems that we can solve that haven't been solved yet? And the recurring theme that came up was that uh, parents would say, you know, my kids love this Jeep or whatever that the kid has and they're driving. But every time we go to use it, the battery's dead. The battery's dead. It's always dead. Huh? And, 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 the, and it takes forever to charge up because it's a lead acid, you know, traditional battery. Uh, so our product development team said, you know, we could solve that problem if we use lithium ion batteries. And this is about seven years ago that we were developing this. Um, oh and, uh, and then uh, our head of product development said, you know, if we're going to do lithium ion batteries, we should make it a Tesla. And this was really before Tesla was as huge as it is. And we thought, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. And not only should we make it a Tesla, we should do to the kids' car market what Tesla has done to the adult car market, and that is change everything, the way you buy it, the fact that the battery. So for the first time, we did lithium-ion batteries, but we also sold it direct to consumers online so people could customize it. They could choose their color just like a Tesla. They could put their kid's name on the license plate. Perfect. Um, and, uh, and so we went to Tesla and we pitched them on the idea. And what they really liked about it was the fact that it was the full kind of Tesla experience, but miniaturized. Um, and, and then we did it and we launched it uh, about five years ago. Uh, and when we launched it, Elon Musk tweeted about it. And after he did that tweet, we got a billion media impressions uh, <laughs> about this product launch. I mean, it was everyone's, just incredible. Everyone's Googling. Uh... Oh, uh, radio flyer. Does this does it have a phone interface? Um, you can well, you can plug in a phone or an MP3 player and play music um, yeah. over there. There's a speaker in the car. Yeah. yeah, you can't turn it on and all that. The um, no. the reason I bring that up is there's so much disengagement with physical, whatever play and imagination and toys, but um, and so over digitization of you know, children's things. It's just, it's sad in some cases how early, you know, children are starting to play with an Android or a uh, Apple device. And um, has this, has, do products like this kind of help bridge that a little bit? Because it's got a little inactivity and... Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think so. We're always taught, we're, we're talking about that a lot. Like, how do we bridge the physical and the digital? And, and we've experimented with a lot of products that do that. We've not launched one yet because we don't feel like we've gotten it quite right yet. But um, but that's one of the reasons why we want to do more storytelling and, and kids exactly. shows like that, because we feel like we can inspire 
active play. K kids are going to watch this stuff. I mean, it's it's compelling. I, may, I have four kids. I've seen it myself. So th I don't think that's going to change. But I think can we cr create some beautiful storytelling that could maybe inspire kids to go out and play is kind of the way we think about it. I love that. Yeah, I've got, uh, got some ideas about that. Well, maybe later. The um, Okay. So, so there's that. There's like, how do you get kids to play with physical things, especially a wagon? They're like, if you bring a kid a wagon or an iPhone now, I'm not going to tell you what they're going to You don't need to do a lot of market research on which one they're going to grab. But the fact that you do a lot of ethnography, you know, as those of you that don't mm -hmm. burn into that, you know, that we're actually just going to consumers' homes and either asking the right questions or just watching them is brilliant because that's how most great products maybe aren't invented, but how they're enhanced. Um, yeah. I, had a, I have a question about the pandemic. We try not to get too topical here, but has that in itself also seen a movement to you know, back to physical toys, back to movement? All I know is, is like when I went to pick up my jet skis and my boat to get them out for the season, they were sold out. You couldn't buy anything new. And I'm trying to get a good bicycle right now. I can't find one. It's like, so this is just in the U.S. It seems like everything sold out that has wheels on it. Is, yeah. Uh, so I guess it's two questions. How has it been for you? Well, you've already said it's been pretty, pretty damn good. Um, but yeah, what do you see that as helping the kids or the parents and the kids kind of going back to that more, what I call imaginative products where you have to yeah. actually make up the story yourself. You can't just watch it on an iPad. Yeah. Back to basics is kind of the way, the way we've been, you know, talking about it. Um, yeah, we're seeing the same trend. I mean, anything, all of our products, tricycles, scooters, ride-ons, the Tesla wagons have seen really significant increases in sales. And and we weren't really, in, back in March, we were thinking just the opposite. We were really concerned that the economy and everything was really going to negatively impact sales. But one of the things that's been, mm -hmm. I think, really gratifying for our whole team is that families are choosing Radio Flyer products because Number one, they trust the brand. They had it when they were a kid and they see there's intrinsic value to a tricycle or to a scooter. I mean, when you're cooped up at home and can't go to the amusement park or can't go on vacation, you know, this can be a, riding around the block is a mini vacation. Uh, getting out in the backyard to play gives the parents a break, you know, from the kids bouncing off the walls in the house. So, yep. Yep. and we've gotten all these wonderful stories. We get these photos and stories from, from people um, thanking us for, for these products, you know, and we share that with our team because we're always, we always want to connect, um, our purpose, um, and to, to, you know, our people's everyday work. And that's been, that's made the whole working from home and everything a lot more, uh, tolerable for our team. I bet. So how have you kept the culture going? Um, first of all, expand on a little bit more about how, how did you get out of that? doldrum mm -hmm. culture i didn't let you finish that story but and then how are you keeping it alive during a you know lockdown pandemic work from home you guys have beautiful offices but nobody's there right now so, <laughs> right so right, exactly. how's, that, how's that going well i mean maybe going back to the years ago how we turned it around I, I, just one story that always sticks in my mind is you know we we didn't have any we didn't have many formal processes for anything and we weren't we didn't have goals that we would set and so Years ago, when I said to, the, I started talking to the team saying, you know, we all should have goals. We all should share our goals with each other. And here's how we're going to write the goals. And I had this kind of big rah-rah meeting I was all excited about. And then adding, uh, one of the guys that had been with the company for many years came up to me and said, so uh, Robert, how much more are we going to get paid now that we got got to have goals? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's some thinking, that's entitlement. Oh, boy. I remember thinking, wow, you know, how, how are we going to stay in business here? But we just changed it. You know, really, it was incrementally, you know, uh, one person at a time. Um, we started to really talk a lot more about our mission and our values. And but the key was really we had to trade out the people that we had at the time were not the people that were going to take us where we needed to go. So we did a lot of early retirements and. And then we we hired uh, new people that were creative and passionate and consumer focused, and that's what really turned it around. Um, but fast forwarding to today, you know, we we have been a work in office culture. I mean, we have not been a work from home or a distributed workplace, and so this was a massive change for us. And and it's been hard. It's it's been hard to to on people. I think especially people who have young kids um, to balance everything. But a few of the ways we've tried to to keep the culture going is usually we have a monthly company meeting, and and that's a huge day for us where 
we celebrate, we talk about how we're doing, we all have lunch together. So we went initially to a, a meeting every week um, to keep that, it was a virtual meeting, but just to keep you know more in touch with people. Now we're doing it every two weeks. Um, I started writing a weekly email uh, to the team, just e either talking about how things are going in the business or sharing something inspirational or sharing some of these consumer stories. Um, and then we've just amped up uh, the one-on-one -on -one connection between managers checking in with their teams. And, and the team has done a remarkable job of getting, getting the work done, doing a really good job, not missing a beat. Um, and I think everybody's taking a lot of pride in that. But I think we're also longing for the more in-person contact. The camaraderie. It's, uh, yeah, we've talked a lot about this on the program in the future of travel, too, and what's, what's happened there. It's... Um... It's going to be a different culture going forward, but you know, companies like yours, I, I assume your glass door ratings are pretty high, at least for you personally, yeah. I'm sure. But um, you know, companies. So this is a little bit of a jaunt, but many CEOs that I've talked to and we are writing about um, have had to do more than you've done. They've because you know maybe their company is like five billion dollars or a billion, and they've had to actually jump down five layers and do a bunch of tactical decision making that they've never done since they were like young in their first job. So they've kind of like cut through the layers, gone down to the front uh, front lines, maybe not the factory floor, and said, "Whoa, okay, we got to fix this, 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 and this." And then now, months later, as they reflected, they're like, "Why the hell do we do it that way? Why are we doing this process this way?" And they're getting smarter about their company. Some of them shady, of course, but. And they're eliminating things, just like you said. It's like the people that got us here maybe aren't the people that we need to go to the next level. We don't need all these layers of management. We need to whatever, fill in the blank. Um, but one of them is culture. So what I've noticed is the companies like you that already had fixed or enhanced or nurture the culture and the passion were are, are surviving better in the pandemic because there's a higher trust level. Whereas others now they're saying, oh my gosh, you were right. We need to rebuild our culture. And yeah. And it's harder in a big company. Many of them are listening in. A lot of you know C-suite types of people, mid 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 career people, are saying, you know, I don't have permission to do that. I'm not like Robert. I don't own the company. It's not a family business. So we encourage them, uh, you know, to break it down into smaller groups as much as possible. Logitech was just on a couple of weeks ago, and they've done a great job at breaking it down. And you know, I, I mentioned he has like 24 direct reports. No CEOs have that, but his. As a believer is keep breaking down the businesses into the size of you know your business quite frankly so any yeah. any tips that you have for people out there that are working either in similar size companies um to yours emerging growth companies and even the big you know there's a lot of bfs's in chicago you know most of the ceos you're on most of the other civic boards like us and um yeah some words of wisdom i think would be useful here from you mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the I always view any crisis is an opportunity, and and some crises um, are f harder to find the opportunities than others. But you can make a lot of changes during a crisis, and if, especially if you're at a larger company and you don't have the kind of um, you know autonomy that I have, being the, the CEO and the owner uh, of the company. So the crisis actually gives you more permission in that case. Yeah, I think absolutely, um, and. And I think, um, so I think that's one. And then I think it's just, it's an opportunity to question and learn. You know, it's just, I, I'm always at, one of the ways we do our goals review process is everyone kind of stands and delivers in front of their teams and says, here's here's how I did on my goal. Here's what went well. Here's what didn't go well. Here's what I learned. And here's what I'm doing next. And the, what I learned is the most important thing. Um, because if we're all learning and reflecting on that, then we are agile, we are adapting to the changing external environment um, and really trying to mine these learnings now. Like I just wrote in my most recent email to the team, you know, I have almost 2 million miles on United Airlines alone, you know, so I have, you know, for my whole career jumped on a plane to go on a first meeting or to, you know, visit someone. And one of the things I've learned is that, you know, does that really make sense? I've been really effective with video calls and right. even with new relationships with people that I didn't know. I never did a video call before this. For those of um, you now, for those of you listening to the podcast and not seeing him live on the TV, he's doing really well. <laughs> Good presence. <laughs> 
it's it's hard. It's hard. Don't forget to look at the camera. What? Okay. Yes. No, yeah. you, talking to a green dot it takes some getting used to, you know. But and some CEOs have resonated to it very well. You didn't. You didn't really. You weren't great at it probably six months ago. And embarrassingly, no. embarrassingly, I'm way ahead of you on, on United. And it's just like so many people are thinking, I don't need to go back to that. Uh, right. It's, it, it's not a great thing for that industry, but. So for business, it's interesting because you're probably not a massive traveling company, but for many companies, I had Salesforce on the other day, a big part of their budget was travel. It's gone. So yeah. they're refunneling it into company culture and mm -hmm. things for these, you know, they're buying people equipment for their homes, the equipment you and I are using and uh, kind of shifting and pivoting. So I'm seeing some good signs there, but that's really good advice is use, use the opportunity crisis as a good, good uh, Chinese term, I think, um, yes. to, to help you pivot and get more permission if you're not the CEO. If you are the CEO, you've, you've got, your, got your work cut out for you. Yeah, the Chinese characters for, for uh, crisis are danger and opportunity. Danger and opportunity, <laughs> exactly. Speaking of danger and opportunity, um, we really want to, first of all, thank you for uh, being on, uh, Robert. We, we haven't had that many uh, uh, Chicago companies on, and uh, you're uh, setting a, a great example. We've got a few coming up, but um, it'd be great to uh, just kind of give us a little vision of the future. So you've mentioned, you know, different types of things you might go into, but yeah, what's next for the company? How, how's the, uh, how's the next few years look? Yeah, I mean, we've grown, you know, since since I started the company, we've grown by 10x and it's all been through coming out wow. with new products. Um, so we're going to just keep doing that. We're going to keep coming out with products that make sense with the brand. Um, and I think anything around outdoor active play is fair game for us because when, you know, Radio Flyer elicits these, these, you know, when you close your eyes and think about Radio Flyer, you see blue sky, you see green grass, you feel the wind in your hair, you know, so those are some really deep parts of the brand that we like to key into. Um, so we're going to keep focusing on that. Uh, we're going to work on, you know, the storytelling and uh, hopefully you'll be seeing a, some sort of a, a beautiful series, um, animated series about Radio Flyer and imagination and um, and keep building a great team that can do all this. Great. Good. Uh, sounds like a good, uh, good plan. Keep it agile, keep it quick and, uh, keep your people uh, happy and, and most of all have fun. It's been yes, fun having absolutely. you on. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Robert. It's been yes, a lot of fun uh, talking with you, Dean. Yeah. I'd love to, uh, maybe, uh, sometime when, when we're allowed to go to your office, love to come in get a tour and, uh, see, uh, see how the, the uh, design group is coming up at the next stage. I think you guys are really, uh, you know, on the ball there, and it's uh, it's good to see, especially for an American uh, American company. So you're you're it, always welcome, and you can get your picture in front of the world's largest wagon. I love that wagon. It's <laughs> like uh, definitely probably causes traffic jams on the street there. <laughs> people seeing it on the side. Little rubbernecking, yeah, when people drive by. I bet. Thanks. You've been listening to Robert Passon, and he is the chief wagon officer of Red Flyer, and we are so happy to see you and uh, take care of yourself. Thanks, Dean.